good morning again. My name is Alex, and I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship Bible, and we are glad that you're here today. If you are visiting with us, man, you get like double bonus points to get out on a day like today. Um, And so we're super excited that you're here. If there's one thing that I would tell you, just be uh, the mission of our church. We exist as a church to worship God, to share Jesus Christ, and build believers. And you are around some of the uh, finest and warmest and friendliest of people in all of Gregg County and Longview here today. And so we are excited that you're here, uh, that you've joined us. Also, before we dive in, just a couple of things. Uh, Creative Night. Uh, I feel like uh, CJ undersold that a little bit. First of all, here's the deal. There's no football that night, and we chose that night because there is no football. (laughs) There is no football, CJ. That's why we chose it. It's the Pro Bowl, and nobody cares about the Pro Bowl. So, anyway. uh, And so we do hope that you'll come out that night. And college students, let me say a word to you uh, in particular. Um, You you should come out that night, because I know that some of you uh, sing. uh, You grew up with a, a camera attached to your hand. It's called a phone. And some of you know how to use that thing, and and you have skills and talents in all of these areas and in technology and uh, playing instruments and leading worship. And so um, one of the greatest things that you could do, and professors that are are in the room, you can close your ears. Uh, But when I went to college, the best thing that I did was found a church, joined it, and got involved. And I don't mean showing up on Sundays at church. I mean getting plugged in and serving it. And college students, that's the best thing that you can do. In fact, that will be more impactful than the degree uh, that you're going to get. And so I want to encourage you this morning uh, to find a church, join it, and serve it. Uh, And so we hope to see some of you at at Creative Night. And then also want to let you know on on Sunday, January 28th, uh, we are going to bring in an associate pastor candidate that weekend. And so your elders have been working hard since September, October uh, time frame. Uh, We had all kinds of interviews during the month of December, had a list of 40 candidates that we narrowed down to like eight or nine and and then narrowed down to two and interviewed those those two a couple of times now and have narrowed it down to one uh, that we're bringing to uh, Longview that weekend. And so you're going to want to be here that weekend and you're going to pay attention to your email because we're going to send you some information. Uh, on that candidate in the next week or so that you've got time to review that resume and questionnaires and that sort of stuff, just information about that candidate. So you're going to want to be here um, in two weeks from today uh, as we bring in that associate pastor candidate. So just mark that in your calendar. Um, It would be an interesting project, but I wonder what it would look like if you added up the attendance at churches in Gregg County this morning compared to the overall population. And when I say this morning, I mean on a normal Sunday morning, not a cold Sunday morning, but a normal Sunday morning. Like, what do you think it would look like if if you added up all of the, and I mean Protestant churches that are uh, here in town, you added up all that attendance that are occupying seats at services this morning all across Gregg County, and then you compare that attendance to the overall population. You can't know for sure. I did do some demographic research uh, this past week looking at different studies, some from 2020 and 2018. It's kind of been hard to wrap our mind around the last few years anyway. But research would tell us in Gregg County, kind of uh, the best case scenario would be that that 75% of Gregg County slept in this morning. And about 25% or one out of every four, kind of best case scenario, would be in church this morning. If you were to consider special Sundays like Christmas and Easter, at best, it's somewhere around 30 to 40 percent. But on any given Sunday, it's probably closer to 20 to 25 percent. If you were to compare that statistic to pre-pandemic numbers, just four to five years ago, or maybe you go back two decades ago, or maybe you go back 40 years ago, those numbers would be astronomically higher. In fact, some studies said that back in the 1980s, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of Gregg County was actually in church on a Sunday morning. That's like one out of every two people. 
I think this goes without saying, and I think you know this to be true already, that the local church has lost and is continuing to lose its influence in the local community and society at large. And there's a myriad of reasons for this. I don't have time to get into all of it today, but one that stands out to me, bigger than perhaps all the rest, is this. The church has lost its influence because Christ followers, Christians, have neglected their responsibility to be influencers. We've abdicated our role, so to speak. And as we've neglected to be what God has called us to be, the world has decided to ignore us. The flip side of this, however, is also true. When Christians decide to be influencers, the world pays attention to us, to what we say and to what we do. Here's what I think we're going to discover uh, today, and let me put it to you plainly. When you are salt and light, the world listens to us, and when you aren't, they don't. When you behave and act as if you're salt and light, when you decide that you want to have an influence on others in the society, you will have that influence, and when you don't act on that, you will not have it. Last week, we started... Um, The series in which we're taking a look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, also known as the Sermon on the Mount, and it's one of the many times that Jesus sat down with his uh, followers, with those who followed him, with his disciples, and um, by extension, the words that he spoke in that sermon that day apply to you and I as his disciples now some 2,000 years later. And in this sermon, Jesus introduces us to something called the kingdom of of heaven. This is a phrase that he uses repeatedly throughout the sermon. And in essence, what he does is he tells his followers, his disciples, you and me, everything that we need to know to live a kingdom-centered life. Here on earth, while we live in the now, waiting on the future kingdom to come. And last Sunday, we we covered the beginning of the sermon by looking at the first 12 verses. And these first 12 verses, Jesus delivers to us what we know as the Beatitudes, right? These are values, these are characteristics that um, describe what it looks like to live a kingdom-centered life. We learn that it isn't something um, that you qualify for by leading a perfect life. Uh, Instead, Jesus says it belongs to those who are spiritually bankrupt, that it belongs to those who are deeply dismayed, who are broken by their sin, that um, it's for people who cannot handle on their own everything that life throws at them. And then here's what's interesting. After making uh, these statements and these observations about what life on earth looks like for a citizen of the kingdom Of heaven, Jesus then uses two metaphors, two word pictures to describe the role that you and I play while we're here on this layover on earth. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. So if you've got your Bible, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, we're going to take a look at just a few short verses today, just four verses, verses 13 through 16. And as you're turning there, I I cannot express this to you strongly enough. If you are a follower of Jesus, these two pictures tell you in part what you're here for. They impart meaning and purpose to your life. And and by the way, this is not just marching orders that we're about to read for pastors and church staff and elders and deacons and missionaries. This is the life calling for everyone who calls Jesus, Lord and Savior. And so let's take a look at this first word picture found in Matthew 5, verse 13. Jesus says this, seven words, you are the salt of the earth. Let's just pause right there. You are the salt of the earth. Let's talk about this first metaphor. Uh, Jesus uses uh, salt. Salt was very common in Jesus' day, just like it is in our day, but it was a very valuable substance. In fact, there's a famous saying that you've heard probably your whole life, and and you might not know the source of it, but the word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which literally means salt money. 
That's what that word means. Salary, when you go to work and you earn a salary, that, that word in its root means salt money. And, and, and back in the day, especially during Jesus' time, Roman soldiers were paid in salt. That was their wages. That's how they collected their wages because salt was a very valuable commodity. And so when a Roman soldier wasn't doing his job, it would be said about them that he wasn't worth his salt. That's where that phrase comes from. Something else about salt. Uh, Just like today, salt's used to flavor food. It was also used to preserve foods. I mean, I think we understand this. Back in Jesus' day, there weren't There wasn't refrigeration. They didn't have, you know, we got two refrigerators at our house. We got one inside and one in the garage that just is there to cool down drinks. They had, I mean, you know, first world problems. But they didn't have any kind of refrigeration back in Jesus' day. And so when you'd go to the Sea of Galilee and you'd catch a bunch of fish, you would pack them in salt. It would keep the fish from spoiling as you sent them to the market in Jerusalem or wherever. It was there to protect and preserve, kept it from spoiling. That's the image Jesus uses here to describe his followers when he says, you're the salt of the earth. Jesus is saying, hey, you, as a Christ follower, as one of my disciples, you add distinctiveness to the world, right, to the the flavor of life on earth. You help to preserve human society. You keep it from spoiling. That's what he's talking about here. And so if it's like, well, if that's true, then how do we put that into practice? What does this look like? Well, if you're following Jesus and you're consistently putting his words into practice in your life, then over time, it said that you will become more and more like Jesus. Don't we believe this to be true? The more that we follow the words of Scripture, the more that we follow Jesus' words, the, the more our lives begin to look like the life of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, that means you'll be like a person who's pleasant to be around. People wanted to be around Jesus. That you'll be helpful, that you'll be compassionate, that you'll be truthful, that you'll be kind, that you'll be honest, that you'll be loving. I mean, you'll be the kind of person that others are attracted to well, just because you're a good person. Let me be clear, though. Jesus is not saying that if you work hard at becoming a really good person that you will earn a place in the kingdom. He's saying that if you have a place in the kingdom, which only comes by God's grace and through a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you will become a really good person as you Follow Christ, and his character is formed in you, right? So Christ followers should be, will be good people. And hear me on this. The cumulative effect of that, of his disciples, uh, I go out, you go out, the cumulative effect of that kind of goodness has an impact on the world. It's like through our moral decency and our charitable acts, believers have made the world a much better place to live. For instance, let me just give you a few data points. Uh, Many of the world's hospitals, and you know this, hospitals, orphanages, and universities were opened in the name of Jesus. Most of all of the Ivy League schools. Missionaries have brought literacy, medicine, education, training, like practical training to millions, if not billions of people all around the world in the name of Jesus. It's the teachings of the Bible and those who follow it that have elevated women to their proper place as human beings equal in value to any man. Our Christian faith inspired the prohibition of slavery and promotes the equal treatment of all people on the planet because we're all valuable in the eyes of God. The Bible formed the basis of Western law. The Bible has been a reliable moral compass that served mankind well for thousands of years despite society's attempts to misrepresent and distort it. The Bible promotes peace and encourages men to treat one another 
with kindness, compassion, patience, understanding. I mean, those who follow Jesus and put the words of the Bible into practice have had and continue to have a tremendous impact on this world. That's what Jesus means when he says, you are the salt of the earth. But notice the stark warning in the second half of that verse. Jesus says, yeah, you're the salt of the earth, but but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So here's what he's getting at. Um, salt in Jesus' day wasn't as pure as the salt that you and I use today. In fact, it was mixed with a lot of impurities. And because it was mixed with impurities, if it got kind of too moist or too wet or it was too humid, uh, then the, the salt would lose its sodiumness. It would lose its saltiness, um, and, and, and it would just become worthless. It, it wasn't good to flavor anything. It wasn't good to preserve anything. And so literally, when it lost its saltiness, you would just throw it out. And you'd just throw it on the ground. It's like, hey, this is some like tasteless trash. And Jesus says, hey, this can happen to us too. It's like when we stop living the way of Jesus, when we permit, when we allow sin to control our lives, when we don't resist temptation, when we give in, he's like, then you cease to become salty. It's like you're ceasing then to have the purifying and enhancing effect on the world that Jesus intends his followers to have while we're living in the now and the not yet. That's the word picture for salt that he uses here. Then he uses another word picture in verse 14. He says this, you are the light of the world. So light's another very common metaphor we see in the Bible along with darkness. Um, light is often used to contrast knowledge and ignorance, right? Light being knowledge, darkness being ignorance. That's why we might say something like, uh, the world is in the dark. Like they just don't know. They're ignorant. The, the world is in the dark, but then we've come to shed some light, right? We, we've come to give some knowledge, to reveal some knowledge on this. Here's what... The Gospel of John says about Jesus, the true light. Here's, here's what it says. You won't see this on the screen, but John 1, 9 says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus himself says about himself in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 12, 46, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. And so Jesus came to earth to show men that God loved them and to demonstrate what he was prepared to do in order to have a relationship with them. And so in a dark, dark world, this revelation is like a piercing bright light. And so the question becomes, what are we to do now? I mean, if that was Jesus' role, if he's the light that's come into the world, where does that leave you and me? Like, what do we do now, now that Jesus is gone? Well, until Jesus returns to establish his kingdom here on earth, he's left you and I to fulfill the role of being light and becoming light to the world. Or... or uh, uh, bringing uh, the light of the knowledge of God's love and forgiveness. That's what Jesus means when he says, you are the light of the world. However, in the same way that salt can lose its saltiness, light can become ineffective. And you're like, well, how? Well, by being hidden. I mean, you know, we know this, light is meant to be seen or it's meant to be displayed so that it allows others to see. Hiding it defeats the purpose of light. And so Jesus uses two examples here in verse 14 to demonstrate that hidden light is ineffective. Look, he says, you're the light of the world. 
a city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. And so the purpose of lighting a lamp, this is kind of like, uh, uh, there's a pun here. It's a light bulb moment, right? <laughs> the purpose of lighting a lamp was so that everyone could see. I mean, if you put it under something, then the purpose is defeated. Here's what I think. This is just, you know, Alex talking here. This is my opinion. But here's what I think is going on. If you remember a few verses back, back to verses 10 through 12, at the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus was talking about being persecuted. He's talking about being mistreated um, for being a Jesus follower. And so I think it's possible that, that because he's just said that, I think it's possible that he's saying, hey, in the face of persecution... We might be tempted to hide our identity. That, that we might not be as bold as we should be. And, and Jesus says if people don't know about our relationship with him, then it defeats the purpose. I mean, if we're going to be effective in the role that Jesus gave us as his followers, then he's saying, well, then you need to be visible. You, you've got to be seen. You got to be a city on a hill. Your light needs to be seen, and you need to shed light on the things of this world to people that are around you. And then look at the final verse, verse 16. It says this In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Also, notice. Right here, the emphasis is on allowing the world to see our good works. I mean, this refers back to the basic goodness, right, that being salt provides. Not only should we be good, but we should let the world see our goodness. And, and the hope, the goal is, is that people will give glory and they will give praise to God. And this is a really important point to catch here. The goal is not that people will say, oh, what incredible Christians they are. You, you know, those people at Fellowship Bible Church, I mean, they are the kindest people. They do incredible good all around town. The goal is not to have people look at us and say, man, how honorable their lives are. The goal is rather that people would say, what a great God they serve. What a great God they follow. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we make it clear that the reason we're living moral lives and doing good deeds is because we're following Jesus. That's if we give God the credit. When we give God the credit then we are being light to the world. I think this means in every good thing we do for others, it's important to give God credit. If we do good but fail to point people to Jesus, then we haven't done what light is supposed to do. And so being salt means that our lives should be characterized by goodness. Being light means that people are to see that God is the source and the purpose of our goodness. Okay, so with those metaphors explained, what, what, what does Jesus think we should do? What, what, how do we become a visible presence in the world that affects, you know, and attracts people to God? How do we go about that? How do we function as salt and light? And so here's what I want to do. In just the few moments that we have left, I want to give you just a quick three-step process to help you become more visible. So for those that are taking notes, just three very practical things real quick. Um, the first is this. Make contact with people. Like, you got to get out and you got to rub shoulders with people in the world. Now, many of you 
work in environments where there's a lot of non-Christians. Some of you in the room work for very large organizations, big corporations, where there's dozens, maybe even hundreds or thousands of people. And so this might be a little bit easier for you than most. But listen, others of us, listen, parents that are in the room, maybe it's, you know, at the, at the Boy Scouts or your kid's community sports team, whatever uh, season it happens to be, you know, at the time. For, for the rest of us, maybe it's, you know, you go to the gym and uh, you, you meet people there and you interact with them there. It's the coffee shop. Wherever you go, it's making contact with unbelievers, Listen, I'm not off the hook either. Man, it's really hard for pastors and church staff oftentimes to, you know, connect with others because inevitably, man, it just comes back around to, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Oh, and, you know, it's like a conversation ender, not a starter. (laughs) But listen, you got to get out in the world. In fact, just um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we've been living uh, in our neighborhood, in our house now for about four months, and we still haven't met all of our neighbors. We've met quite a few, but there was a house just a couple of doors down, and we hadn't met them yet, and they had a garage sale. We just went down to the garage sale. I think I had like 20 bucks in my pocket, and I'm like, I'm just going to go down there. We're going to meet our neighbors. I'm going to buy some stuff from them. I'm just going to get out. The whole, the whole purpose was I didn't need anything from that garage sale. I just went down there to make contact and to meet my neighbors. However, I did find one of those little grass putting mats, and it's now in my office. (laughs) So now I brought my putter and golf balls, and now I putt in my office. It's three bucks. It was hard to pass up. (laughs) But you got to get out, and you got to make contact. You got to meet people. Listen to some of the words of Jesus' final prayer to his followers. In John chapter 17, he says this, verse 11, I'm no longer in the world, but they're in the world. I mean, he's praying for his disciples, and again, by extension, you and me, he's like, God, I'm I'm no longer in the world, but they are. Verse 15, "I, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from evil. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a tension here, isn't there? It's like we're to remain unpolluted by the world, but the place that we belong is in the world. Right in the middle of it. Involved with people who need to see the light of Jesus in us. That's the first step. You got to make contact. You got to rub shoulders with unbelievers. Here's the second thing. It's to serve them. This is so important. Um, I grew up in a day and time in the 80s when I was a, a young Christian where we didn't view people as people. We viewed people as converts, as potential converts. It wasn't until I got older that I began to see people not just as a a tally mark, not just as a notch on the belt, not just as someone who should be on my spiritual radar and and on my target, but just a person who who has some needs and perhaps they need those needs met. How can I serve them? Our love for the unbeliever should be demonstrated in our willingness to serve them, to come alongside them. I love how the Apostle Paul described his own ministry among, by the way, unbelievers in Thessalonica. Look at what he says in 1 Thessalonians. He says, we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also ourselves, because you had become very dear to us. I mean, notice that the message was communicated in both words and works. It's both. I mean, Paul let these people see him live life. He demonstrated to them on a day-by-day basis what life in Jesus looked like. 
And the Thessalonians could see that goodness that Jesus produced in his followers, and they longed to have that as well. They wanted to experience that kind of life too. And so when you live that kind of goodness out in front of others, it will cause some to desire that kind of life that we have. And so you got to make contact. you got to serve them. Here's the third thing. You have to point people to Jesus. You have to point people to Jesus. I mean, that's the third thing. I, I can't remember who, who said it. I should probably know this. Maybe it was St. Francis of Assisi that is famous for saying, um, what is it? What's the saying? Preach the gospel and when necessary, use words too. Uh, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. There's no way to communicate the gospel without using words. You have to point people to Jesus. Living a good life for the sake of living a good life isn't the gospel. It doesn't get it done. You've got to point people to Jesus. We need to be ready to tell them. Here's what 1 Peter 3 says. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. It's really important that we follow up our good behavior, our good actions, our good deeds by pointing people to Jesus. If we don't, then we're shining our light on emptiness instead of shining it on the world's only hope. So as we land the plane this morning, you and I, we are the salt of the earth. We're meant to live morally pure lives and to do good deeds to benefit the people of this planet. And as light of the world, we're to live this way visibly in front of the people in the world so that our lives point people to Jesus so that they too can find life in him who is life. That's the task that Jesus has put us on this spinning globe to accomplish. We can still worship him when we get to heaven. We can still serve him when we get to heaven, we can still sing songs of praise and will sing songs of praise to him when we get to heaven. We can still fellowship with each other when we get to heaven. But one thing we cannot do when we get to heaven is help other people get there. And so, may we be people who understand what it means to be salt and light. May we be people who understand that living a kingdom-centered life is being salt and light to a world that so desperately needs Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you bow with me? Close your eyes with me for just a minute. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we thank you for uh, its encouragement and, um, Lord, its exhortation. And sometimes this exhortation makes us feel a little uncomfortable, and yet, Lord, that is exactly what we, we are here to do. I mean, you've told us in your word, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so, God, I just pray that today as we leave this place, as we get in our cars and we head to lunch somewhere and we begin to make contact and rub shoulders with those who perhaps are far from you, that you would give us a holy discontent Holy Spirit, that you would 
Help us to find ways to serve our neighbor, to serve those in our workplace, those people in the community that we come in contact with, and ultimately, so that we can point them to Jesus. Um, You could do amazing things if just 10, 15 people in this room took those words seriously this morning. Father, if 40 people, if 50 people would take this seriously, then revival would break out in Gregg County, perhaps unlike anything we've ever seen or witnessed. And so I pray, God, that that revival would start with us today as we heed your word to be salt, to do good, and to be light, and to be visible. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you so much for being here uh, today. We're going to continue on with this series next week. Probably going to cover several um, verses next week. Jesus uh, gets into some issues of lust and anger and divorce. And so, man, it's going to be uplifting (laughs) message. It's always uplifting because he's our hope. Amen? Yeah. So I hope you'll come back uh, next week. And then, as I said, in two weeks, we'll take a break from that because our associate pastor uh, candidate will be here. And so I just ask in the meantime that you'd be praying uh, for that process. You'd be praying uh, for that candidate. That you'd be praying uh, for the elders and for our church uh, as well. Can you do that? Awesome. Would you stand as we read our benediction together? These words will be on the back screen or the front screen. Back screen for me, front screen for you. Let's read this out loud. Father, help us to live this week to the full being true to you in every way. Jesus, help us to give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. Holy Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. You're dismissed.